Welcome to the sixth lecture for International Regulatory Frameworks for Climate Change and Environmental Management. In this lecture, we are looking at the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Last week, you recall, we started looking at UNCLOS, but we looked at marine pollution in the context of MARPOL 7378. This week, we are continuing with UNCLOS, and we're looking at maritime zones, and hopefully, if we get time, fisheries. It might spill over into next week's lecture, but I um, hope that we'll be able to get through it uh, today, but I don't want to rush it. It's a really important convention and I put a lot of work into this lecture because there's so many interesting areas, uh, interesting topics relevant to UNCLOS that you know, we could, this is another one of the conventions that we just spend the entire course just on UNCLOS. So in this lecture, we're looking at maritime jurisdiction in particular, so maritime zones, which is particularly important for controlling fisheries, but also petroleum and mining in coastal waters and out in, onto the continental shelf. So maritime jurisdictions is a particularly important international topic. Uh, we'll also look at briefly at deep sea mining in the, um, basically out in the, in the deep sea and uh, fisheries. And we'll find that UNCLOS is very good at regulating fishing within national waters or um, national maritime zones. But once you get out beyond 200 nautical miles into the high seas, it's actually really poor at regulating fishing. And there's a whole range of uh, regional or specific uh, international regimes regulating particular fisheries or areas. And we'll look at a couple of examples. The Convention on the Conservation of Southern Bluefin Tuna and also the Convention on the Conservation of and Management of Highly Migratory Fish Stocks in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean. We're continuing the context that we set last uh, week when we talked about UNCLOS. So this is in the period of 1980-1990 rapid growth still uh, height, heightened concern for the environment, particularly with recognised emerging global threats during this period of things like the hole in the ozone layer. At the end of the 1980s, the Brundtland Report is released, which is a watershed for the development of um, concepts in international environmental policy, particularly the concept of sustainable development. And it's also a period of major geopolitical shift as the Soviet Union breaks up and the Berlin Wall falls. I put up this quote last week from uh, Gillian Triggs. I really like it, I said that last week, but I think it's just international law of the sea ebbs and flows with the evolving geopolitical priorities of the age. And we'll see that particularly with maritime zones, that they've basically grown over time. Okay, so UNCLOS is a massive treaty. Uh, it took 10 years to negotiate, began in 1973, was finally signed in 1982. It uh, has 166 parties currently. The Secretary is in New York. Um, the COPs are once a year. Uh, you can look at its homepage, there's heaps of information there. Uh, it is enormous. It's 320 articles uh, divided into 27 parts plus nine annexes. Uh, the parts most important to environmental regulation, again, I mentioned these last week. Um, we'll look at them in this lecture. Uh, part two, the territorial sea and the contiguous zone. Part five, the exclusive economic zone. Part six, the continental shelf. Part seven, the high seas. Part 11, the seabed and ocean floor, which is called the area. And also part 12, which is generic or general protection and preservation of the marine environment. It's important to understand the historical background um, for maritime zones and fisheries management under UNCLOS. So I want to start with the position under customary international laws. You'll remember that there's two main sources of international environmental law. The main one and the one that we virtually completely focused on in this course are under the conventions or the treaties that are agreed between nations. But apart from international agreements, there's also customary international law, which are the uh, obligation or the uh, 
laws that countries recognised as being bound by, even though there's no specific agreement. Uh, and internationally, there was a limit to three nautical miles of what you could claim for your maritime zones. That was under customary international law, and that comes from the Bering Sea Fur Seals arbitration, particularly recognised that. But other customary international laws that are really important, I mentioned uh, in the uh, lecture, I think, too, when we talked about sovereignty, that sovereignty itself is a concept that comes from customary international law. How countries recognise who controls what territory isn't, well, it can be, a, there can be an agreement, like Alaska was sold to the US, and we'll see that um, when the, the Bering First Seals arbitration brings that out. So you can have agreements recognising territories being exchanged or recognising borders, but the fundamental concepts for sovereignty is actually based on customary international law. So the Bering First Seals arbitration involves the Bering Strait, or Bering Strait, which uh, lies between Alaska and Russia, and it's a very obviously cold and inhospitable part of the world. Uh, it's named after uh, it was a uh, he was a um, from the Netherlands. Actually, he might have been Danish. I think it was a Danish sea captain who was contracted by the Tsar of Russia to uh, sail up with uh, a fleet of three ships and explore this area and claim it for Russia back um, several centuries ago and it's, the strait is named after him. It was obviously an incredibly risky mission in those times when you, know, you would have had a ship, you had ships with no motors, uh, no, basically you're sailing into completely uncharted waters and it's extremely rough and dangerous. A uh, little historic uh, note, this is a copy of the check that the US uh, gave to Russia when it purchased Alaska in 1867. So it purchased it for 7.2 million dollars. Uh, so that's a copy of the check. Uh, and obviously Alaska's uh, now highly prior, you know, lot it, it was sold basically because the Russian Tsar needed money at the time and they, the Russians thought that they had exhausted all of the useful resources of Alaska so they'd basically sealed and taken a lot of, um, they were after basically, yeah, seals in the area and they'd pretty well wiped those out and they wanted the money and they didn't think there was any more that could be gotten out of Alaska. And these are the days before petroleum and the gold rush in Alaska and the like. Uh, this was a, a funny story I saw back a couple of years ago with, remember when the US was talking about its huge levels of debt. It's still got huge levels of debt, but one solution was um, possibly they could sell Alaska. Uh, it would be worth about uh, 2.5 trillion, which would go a fair way to uh, at least paying off um, George Bush's um, wars. Uh, so they spent trillions of dollars on wars, but. Um, uh, at the time when uh, the US purchased Alaska from Russia, it was seen by the press and a lot of the US public as complete folly. Uh, in fact, it was called um, Seawood's Folly or um, Seawood's Icebox. Um, that was the uh, Secretary of State, William Seawood, who basically uh, was really keen on the purchase. But one New York newspaper that year called Alaska a sucked orange, saying Russia had already drained it of all the value in it. So the um, islands where the Bering Fur Seals are located are um, the Pribilof Islands, and they lie beneath the Bering Strait. Just a couple of pictures of them. So this is St. George Island um, in the Bering Strait, uh, obviously on a good day. Um, here is uh, the northeast fur seal rookery on St. George Island. You can see some of those little black things in the different distance of the seals. Uh, the, just a township on St. Paul. And here's a um, fur seal. And just a rookery of them on um, George Island. If we wind back a couple of centuries now, uh, we, these are a couple of um, illustrations of that um, North Rookery, 
um, on uh, St George Island and this is some pictures uh, or illustrations of um, basically the seal meat um, being hung up, up to dry and then you see the picture up in the top right is basically uh, a sealer um, boat going out and um, harpooning or catching seals and then some of the um, houses on the island and here's a killing gang at work basically going out and clubbing the fur seals to death on the ground and here's the catching uh, the skins, so drying out the skins. So the, the seals were heavily exploited uh, and when the US bought Alaska it wanted to conserve the, the uh, seal um, population because basically they'd been driven so low that they were in danger of basically being wiped out. So uh, the US made some laws prohibiting uh, the killing of seals and it also tried to regulate seals when they swam away from the islands. And uh, U the United Kingdom through um, basically controlled Canada obviously at the time, it challenged the US's right to protect the seals when they left the islands. And it went to arbitration so there wasn't an international court at the time but they, the countries agreed that they would resolve the dispute by uh, giving it to an arbitration panel and the arbitration panel held that the US couldn't control the seals when they swam away from the islands. The US claimed that because they came back to the islands basically they still had proprietary right or right to control what happened to them even when they swam away from the islands. The arbitration ruled that the US couldn't do that but it was concerned about the loss of fur seals so it set up a number of plans for the conservation of uh, the seals between the two parties that, that is the UK and the US and I'll just run through them because they're actually it's, it's laid the foundation for pretty well the whole of marine protected area conservation over the last century is pretty well re relates to what the, this panel proposed. You got a question? So who did they go for for arbitration? Who did they go to? Uh, it just would have been a um, group of experts appointed at the time. So if they had a recognised expert in, you know, in the law of the sea at the time, so they appointed, you, countries can agree on an arbitration and you agree on an arbiter. So if there's one highly respected or a panel of highly respected um, people in the area that can hear it. They might have been former judges or but there wasn't, effect, there wasn't an international uh, court like there is now. So uh, it was just basically an ad hoc arbitration. So the tribunal ruled that uh, or set up a conservation plan. First was to have a prohibited zone within which sealing couldn't occur. There's also to be a closed sealing, a, se <laughs> closed sealing, a closed season uh, in a defined area of the high seas uh, with some exceptions for indigenous hunting. Uh, there was to be a limitation on the type of vessel used, uh, a licensing system for seal hunting, a use of a special flag when sealing, uh, they had to keep catch records, there was to be an exchange of data collected and there was government responsibility for choice of suitable crews and a plan the plan was to be enacted into national uniform laws in the US and Britain and national measures adopted to ensure enforcement. And there was to be a three year ban or moratorium on all sealing. Um, if you like that's back in 1893. You could find all of those elements pretty well in, in every fisheries or protected area uh, program around the world. But at the time it was completely groundbreaking. No one had suggested you know, having such an approach for management of an international um, resource. Now the plan failed as a lot of uh, fisheries management in international waters has failed. It failed for the similar reasons um, as later ones failed. What happened was after the arbitration uh, the US and British Canadian vessels that didn't want to be controlled by the agreement and the national laws that Britain and the US enacted, they simply uh, re-registered uh, in other countries to avoid being subject to US and Canadian laws. So basically they re-flagged with Russian 
um, or Japanese um, flags uh, and then continued to carry out the sealing because then in international waters they weren't subject to the US and Canadian laws. Remember how we talked about uh, countries can control activities within their jurisdictions but outside of that you can only control your own citizens or your own vessels that um, are basically registered within your territory. So uh, by avoiding basically going to other countries they avoided the national regime. Yep. If they were, I mean, I guess crew crew may have citizens from multiple countries but if a majority or like a number of citizens, or citizens from either country was on the ship? Yeah, good question. If you, could you look at the um, majority of you know, where the crews actually came from? Uh, generally, you, you can only control your own citizens, basically. A country's laws can only control your own citizens. So, for instance, uh, Australia might prohibit genocide anywhere in the world. Uh, and those laws are effective um, for our citizens. So if someone goes to um, you know, northern Iraq at the moment and participates in killing of, a, of an ethnic group or Syria and then returns to Australia, they can be prosecuted under Australian law. Uh, we've also, uh, uh, under our, uh, I think I mentioned when we talked about whaling, that Australia prohibits its nationals killing cetaceans, whales, dolphins and porpoises, anywhere in the world. Uh, and it can do that for its own citizens, uh, but generally it's much more typical for countries just to focus on their own flag vessels and not basically um, make laws specific to citizens in relation to fishing. Uh, it's, it's unusual to link it to citizens. Uh, it's much more usual with fishing to just use the flag vessels. Anyway, they shifted countries, avoided the um, moratorium and the ban and the seal population continued to decline until basically it was pretty well wiped out and led to a convention on the Bering Sea fur seals in 1911, just before the outbreak of World War I. But classic story that's been repeated multiple times in different fisheries around the world. I wanted to emphasize uh, this because I want to just, just mention the growth in maritime zones. In the Bering Sea fur seal arbitration, the limit of maritime zones that was recognized was three nautical miles. Does anyone know where the three nautical miles comes from? Cannonballs. Yes, cannonballs. It was linked to the, the limit or the distance that cannons could fire in the 1800s uh, and basically uh, countries used that um, as the measure for what could be controlled from land and the, uh, because trade by sea was so important uh, through all of er, at that time, France, uh, the United Kingdom, um, Spain, all of the big uh, European powers that were exploring the world and you know, trading wanted to limit the extent of national waters as much as possible so that basically trade couldn't be interrupted. So there was an interest in constricting national waters as much as possible. So three nautical miles was appropriate at the time but uh, as technology grew in, in the 20th century uh, the countries wanted to expand the national waters to protect fisheries. So in 1972 there was the Icelandic fisheries case which recognised an extension out to 12 nautical miles for control of fisheries and then UNCLOS leapt out to 200 nautical miles and under UNCLOS you can control fisheries and other marine, marine resources including whales and seals out to 200 nautical miles. Uh, so it was a massive leap out. So let's look then at the modern framework for maritime zones under UNCLOS and this is parts two to seven in UNCLOS and I've given you this diagram in a handout and it's the best thing I think you can, you don't need to take a lot of notes in this lecture. This diagram really, you know, if you scribble all over this diagram any notes you want to you take then that's um, you know, a good way, it's a good way of drawing together the, di the different zones. Um, so I'll come back, we'll, we'll, we'll talk through this uh, diagram in more detail or, or the different parts of it as we go. But if you look at a real example, 
of the maritime zones. We say look at Australia's maritime zones. This is a map showing the, the areas that Australia claims. Uh, you can see the big mustard area around Australia which is Australia's exclusive economic zone. It's the most significant. If I just go back to the diagram for a moment. So we've got a baseline. I'll talk about that some more. 12 nautical miles is the territorial sea. Uh, well, three nautical miles is a coastal waters. Territorial sea goes to 12 nautical miles. Contiguous zone is significant for customs, but not really that important for um, environmental regulation. It's the exclusive economic zone that's the really significant one because countries, a coastal state can control fishing and any ac basically any fishing activities. When I say fishing, I also include um, you know, damaging any marine organisms like seabirds or whales um, or turtles or any of those sorts of things. So any marine, living marine resources within the EEZ can be controlled by the coastal state. So the exclusive economic zone is absolutely critical for coastal states. Beyond that, it's called the high seas uh, and there's, as, we've, as I've said numerous times, there's very limited control that nations can exercise over um, non-nationals and non-flagged or their vessels that aren't flagged within their jurisdiction on the high seas. And the high seas is enormous. Um, the, another one we'll mention is the continental shelf, which is you can see down here where the, basically the continental shelf drops away. To the edge of the continental shelf, countries can also control petroleum um, extraction from the seabed. Now the continental shelf might be within the EEZ, but it also might extend out beyond the EEZ. So if you look at that in a real sense, this map of Australia, these blue areas, say off um, Western Australia and down here off Tasmania, though that's where the continent, continental shelf extends beyond the 200 nautical mile EZ. All the areas where there's no light blue are areas where the continental shelf is within the 200 nautical mile um, EZ. And as I said, the continental shelf is important for control because a country can control petroleum extraction and mining on the continental shelf, but it can't actually control fishing in its continental shelf unless it's within the EEZ. So EEZ is particularly important. If we focus on Queensland, and if you flip over your handout, um, I've given you this so that, you, again, you can scribble on it, because it's, I think it's really good to actually look at real coastlines and to get a feeling for how they fit together. You'll see that uh, I've given you uh, also the key, so the Yellow is the territorial sea baseline or the baseline in international waters. Uh, and then there's um, coastal waters, which are three nautical miles. Uh, territorial sea, which is 12 nautical miles. The contiguous zone, 24. EZ, 200 nautical miles. Uh, just to mention also, I talk about nautical miles. Does anyone, it's actually on your handout, but if you, does anyone know how much a nautical mile is without looking at the handout? I think you've looked, Nick. Does anyone know without actually... Um, so we know a, a standard mile is you know, the, the one that the um, United States of America still uses, um, is what, 1,000 feet? Yeah, OK, you can really tell you're, you're <laughs> from the US when you're talking in feet. Um, about 1,600 metres, isn't it? OK, but a nautical mile is... 1,852 metres roughly, and you might say, well, why did they come up with a different um, distance? Uh, the, the reason is it actually comes from um, marit the maritime use from a few centuries ago. Uh, it's, it, it's very close to the mean value of the length of one minute of latitude at the equator, and it was used by ships to measure distance uh, as a, and it became a universal me measure in maritime, uh, yeah, in maritime um, issues, and it's been adopted for um, the maritime zones under UNCLOS. So yeah, it's about 1,852 metres, which is significant because then, when you talk about 200 nautical miles, it's about 370 kilometres. It's actually a really significant amount of area. It's, not, it's a lot more than 200 uh, kilometres. So when 
a country has an island that they have sovereignty over, that's really significant because it all starts again. You get your, um, basically you get 200 nautical mile EZ around an island. So control of islands becomes really important and I'll come back to that. We'll talk about some examples uh, about conflicts that are going on between China and Japan uh, about the control of islands and a lot of it's to do not with so much with what's on the island but because if you have sovereignty over the island you then get all of the area around it and that can be particularly important for oil and gas um, rights to basically extract from that area. So um, this, I'll, I'll focus in a bit on a couple of examples just to I illustrate it. Yes, Adam. Yes, that's really good. I'll come to when you're less than two, well, when you're less than 400 nautical miles from another country, you basically split the difference. So your EEZ will be cut down um, to basically the mid midline between it. Yes. Is that size limit to the island? Like, <coughs> what's the minimum size? To the island? Really good question. What's the minimum size to the island? Basically, there's definitions in the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. Uh, it becomes really problematic with reefs and the like, but basically they've got to be above high water. Uh, there's a whole heap of disputes in the South China Sea about basically reefs and then countries building up platforms on top of them and claiming them as islands. Uh, it's quite, it, it would be funny if it isn't actually really serious and countries, you know, virtually going to war over a reef because it's not for the reef, it's for the petroleum that's potentially around it. So if we focus in on if yes, another question? Yeah, good question. What if due to global warming islands are lost? Um, at this stage we haven't really had to face that issue so much. Most of, but basically you could lose yeah, you, you could actually lose an island, um, but we haven't seen uh, islands. Um, it hasn't s featured significantly at this stage, but potentially you could actually lose your maritime zone if the island is no longer an island. What about man-made islands? Man-made islands? In Saudi Arabia or Singapore? Yeah, man-made islands could, like if you... Uh, when we talk about maritime zones, they're actually pretty bloody big. Um, you know, like the small extensions out of a you know, few hundred metres or a kilometre even, like in Saudi Arabia that you see, it is actually like a little blip really when you start looking at maritime zones. Can I just give you an example? Like if you look at Brisbane, um, if, we f if I've just focused in on Brisbane and, and the, you've got it on your map, but basically it's far too small for you to see, so all I've done is zoom in on Brisbane and so here we are, about here I think, uh, and the territorial sea baseline actually goes around Morton Island and North Stradbroke Island, see that yellow? Because they're regarded as coastal islands and there's rules in the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea on when you can basically draw straight lines to go around or basically join up points so you don't just you don't have to come in from an island because that's pretty pointless so if it's so close that you can basically just draw a straight line across so the territorial sea baseline goes around those and basically it's the low water mark uh, at running along those coastlines with some straight lines there's a whole heap of rules we don't need to worry about them you can basically pick up any nautical chart uh, that, or a chart that shows um, maritime zones and you can work out for an area where they are. Uh, if we were oceanographers or the like, you know, we could go into the details of it, but for our purposes it doesn't matter. Um, then you can see the territorial sea, the contiguous zone, and then the jump out to the EEZ. And so with Brisbane, um, as I said, there's the territorial sea baseline going around um, Morton Island here and um, Stradbroke Island, North Stradbroke Island with um, 
a straight line drawn, drawn, drawn across. Actually, I got it in the wrong spot, didn't I? It should go up there. Okay, so that's a practical example right here in Brisbane. I just want to mention the difference between sovereignty versus sovereign rights. It might sound quite abstract, but it's, ba it's an important difference when we talk about maritime zones. Uh, and you can think about sovereignty like uh, owning a house. So who here lives in a house that they own or your parents own? So that if you own your house and it's freehold land, it basically means you own the land and you know, if you want to paint it or you know, put an extension on or do something like that, you can do it because you own it. So who here lives in, in a unit or a house that you rent? Okay, so you know that if you want to um, put a you know, picture up or do something to change it, you need to get permission from the owner. So you have a lease to live there, someone else owns it, but you have an agreement that gives you a right of access and a right to use that property. And so sovereign rights are like leasehold rights in that it's not full ownership but you've got certain rights of use. So think of it in that way. Um, and I want to just run through some of the wording of UNCLOS, not so that you remember the detail. Um, the main thing I want you to take away is that diagram and just have a, an idea that the EZ is really important. Um, but if we build up the different maritime zones, the territorial, t <laughs> territorial sea and the contiguous zone, <coughs> Article 2 says the legal status of the territorial sea, um, the sovereignty of a coastal state extends beyond its land territory and internal waters and in the case of an archipelagic state, um, archipelago. Uh, anyway, you can say like Indonesia is an archipelago. It's a, um, it's a nation that's basically made up of islands. Um, so that's an um, archipelagic state. Um, so its waters um, extend, uh, its um, sovereignty extends out um, over the territorial sea and the breadth is defined in Article 3 as 12 nautical miles. So states actually own out to 12 nautical miles. So like they own the land, they own out to 12 nautical miles. It's actually theirs. The, there's a whole series of definitions in UNCLOS about the baseline, reefs, straight baselines and like. Again, you don't need to know the detail, but um, the normal baseline, except where otherwise provided in this convention, the normal baseline for measuring the breadth of the territorial sea is the low water mark along the coast as marked on large scale charts officially recognised by the coastal state. And there's a, a bit about reefs straight baselines that basically where there's deep indentations and fringing islands and the like, you can have straight baselines. As I showed you with um, Brisbane with the jump out to Morton Island. Um, the really important uh, maritime zone, as I mentioned, let's, let's skip over the contiguous zone. It's significant for customs. So for instance, when, uh, what was the, that, um, uh, asylum seeker boat that came from Sri Lanka that sailed across uh, and that Australia basically took and then wouldn't say anything about the High Court challenge about a month ago. I can't remember what the name of the boat was. But remember that occurred? Well, well basically Australia wouldn't have been able to arrest it until it came within its um, contiguous zone. So it's significant for customs but from an environmental perspective it doesn't really matter. The really important one is the EEZ. Um, so the EEZ uh, is the area beyond and adjacent to the territorial sea, subject to the specific legal regime established under this part of UNCLOS, um, under which the rights and jurisdiction of the coastal state and the rights and freedoms of other states are governed by this convention. Article 56 says that in the EEZ, the coastal state has sovereign rights. Notice that I mentioned sovereignty before and sovereign rights. So it's not full ownership but the coastal state has rights to explore and exploit, conserve and manage natural resources, whether living or non-living, 
um, of the waters um, super adjacent to the seabed, so everything above the seabed in the water column um, and to the seabed and basically the rights to explore it and control it and produce energy and yeah, do all of those things. And the breadth of the EZ is defined in Article 57 uh, as 200 nautical miles from the baseline. So it's not 200 nautical miles from the edge of the um, territorial sea, it's 200 nautical miles basically from the low water mark. So, um, and then there's a part in UNCLOSC about the continental shelf. So the continental shelf, there's a definition of it, but basically you know it's where the, the um, continent dips down into the deep sea. Um, now when it goes, it can it be within 200 nautical miles or it might be beyond it, it might be beyond it. And within the continental shelf, or over the continental shelf, the state, if it's outside 200 nautical mile EEZ, the state can't control fisheries, but it can control um, exploitation of basically petroleum and mining on the seabed. So drilling on the continental shelf, Article 81, coastal states shall have the exclusive right to authorise and regulate drilling on the continent, continental shelf for all purposes, but it can't control fisheries if it's beyond 200 nautical mile EEZ. So those um, uh, are the basic uh, maritime zones and as I said the 200 nautical mile EZ is a real, really important one to understand. Coming back to the question about uh, the islands that um, in that map I showed you that doesn't have a full circle around them, if another s state has territory within 400 nautical miles so that both of them can't have 200 nautical miles, um, what happens? Basically, you split the difference, um, as I said. So if we look at the Torres Strait between uh, Australia and Papua New Guinea, it's a lot shorter than 200 nautical miles. Uh, and you can see there, in that region, Australia doesn't even have an EEZ as such because it's so close, there's all these islands, uh, that effectively um, Australia pretty well has a territorial sea that merges with Papua New Guinea's territorial sea. And there's, in fact, there's a... Um, treaty between Papua New Guinea and Australia um, called the Torres Strait um, Treaty which deals with traditional use and customs within that area and fishing and the like. So um, that's an example of yeah, that split and that's just a different diagram of the same um, thing showing that the continental shelf might go out beyond the EZ. Um, or it might not, uh, and islands are really significant. Okay, how is the maritime boundary determined when adjacent um, countries have winding coastlines? So we've talked about like PNG and, and Australia that are opposite to each other, but what about something like, uh, you know, like the Gulf of Mexico where it curls around? Um, Article 15 allows for delineation of the territorial sea between states with opposite or adjacent coastlines and basically um, the states talk about the equidistance. Um, basically um, an equal point or basically split the difference between them however that occurs. Um, I'm just going to show you a few examples of actually splitting the difference um, where you've got curling baselines. I just mentioned that because uh, these, this is, if countries can't agree on it, then who can resolve it? Uh, the International Court of Justice has been particularly active in the last few decades in resolving disputes about maritime zones and that's actually allowed under UNCLOS. There's a number of different mechanisms for dispute res resolution. There's countries can choose the International Court of Justice. There's also a special tribunal called the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea or ITLOS. Um, but the ICJ has been particularly important for resolving maritime disputes. So we mentioned the ICJ when we talked about whaling. Remember Australia has just won a case against J Japan about whaling. Uh, yes, David, you've got a question? Um, yeah, just, if it's a lake, what's the two countries? Is that, is that exactly the same rules? Or uh, good question about lakes. Can I actually get to the Black Sea, which is maybe we call it a big lake? Um, because if it's a 
yeah, if it's a lake, then presumably you'd split the difference between them. But UNCLOS probably wouldn't apply necessarily to a freshwater lake between, say, two countries um, like in, say, Africa with, you know, some of the big lakes and if there's a country on either side of them, UNCLOS wouldn't actually apply to it if it's, you know, it's not in the ocean. Um, okay, so the ICJ, uh, this sits in the Peace Palace in The Hague in the Netherlands, a beautiful building. Uh, I showed you some pictures of it when we talked about whaling. Beautiful building. Um, amazing court, um, a massive panel of judges. They sit with 15 or 20 judges. Um, one of the recent decisions has been about the Black Sea and a dispute between... Um, so here's just the Black Sea catchment. And we've got the Ukraine, haven't we, in Russia? So obviously lots of fighting going on at the moment um, in eastern... Ukraine is actually really, I, I don't know about you guys, when I'm looking at the news reports thinking actually it looks really scary. Russia seems to have just full on invaded the Ukraine um, and like how can they deny that <laughs> like there's like satellite images showing hundreds of tanks. You know what, they think like pixies just you know magic them or where did they come from? <laughs> like this seems ludicrous but it, yeah it just seems, uh, it seems really scary how it's escalating and um, it seems yeah very difficult to resolve. Um, okay, uh, back um, in 2009, the ICJ made a ruling on a dispute between uh, Romania and U the Ukraine about the delineation of um, maritime zones between the two countries. And here you can see a coastline curling around in a really difficult way. The blue line, so the Ukraine, so here's Romania, and it wanted the red line, so you can see it would maximise its area, and here's Ukraine to the north, and it wanted the blue line, so which would maximise its area. So both of them claimed, um, they had different claims, and basically the um, ICJ pretty well split the difference. So if I just go back to, here's what they both claimed, here's what the ICJ ruled, it pretty well cut, didn't quite, didn't give either of them exactly what they wanted but gave a bit to each. So that's delineation. Uh, a more, slightly more complicated one, it was complicated because it was a whole heap of historic treaties between the two countries but are very controversial. So um, folk from Nicaragua or Colombia? So yeah, this was very controversial and I think it's still very heated. Um, it took 11 years before the ICJ and um, this is just a report about it in 2012. UN ruling gives Colombia islets but Nicaragua more sea. Uh, and this was a dispute um, ab about, so here's Colombia and here's Nicaragua. And this is what Nicaragua claimed, the area, so that big orange area and there was a number of small islands in this area which were um, which belonged to Colombia uh, and that Colombia claimed um, basically that was the line so just going back this is Nicaragua's line would give them a much larger um, maritime area uh, Colombia's claim would have given them a much larger uh, maritime area and Nicaragua would have been much smaller and the ICJ agreed basically with Nicaragua uh, and so um, Colombia was very unhappy with the decision uh, and I remember reading some reports about you know the president or whatever calling it just outrageous and complete travesty of justice and continuing to bang the table. Uh, it, this was a complicated one because as I said there's a lot of historic treaties between a lot of history about the control of the islands uh, and that area. So it wasn't just a straight delineation. Uh, another very recent one, this was uh, just came out early this year, Peru and Chile. So um, uh, folk from Peru and Chile. So put your hands up if you're from Peru or Chile. So cool. Uh, so this involved basically the delineation between the 
of the maritime area between Peru and Chile. You can see it curls around. Uh, and you can see, so here's Peru. And the red line is what Peru claimed, so which would give it a larger area. And the blue line is what Chile claimed, which would also give it a larger area. Um, and this is what the ICJ decided, which again, <laughs> So to split the difference between the two, uh, it's, to give, um, it's not obviously not as simple as the ICJ just decides to give half to each, but you'll often find that the two parties claim the maximum that they think they can get away with. So the fact that the court actually goes down the middle um, is probably just rec a recognition that the parties tried to push it, push the boundaries of what they thought they could get. Uh, and the ICJ splitting down the difference, going down the middle is probably um, the right answer. So that's just a few examples where you see real coastlines and real splits. Yes? Okay, so here's the construction of the equidistance lines and you can see this is a great question. Um, I think you deserve a chocolate for that. And this map, you can see how basically the ICJ, whoop, too much. Uh, but you can see how the ICJ basically ruled out from all of those points to get the equidistance between the two. Obviously quite complicated, but really significant for these countries because there might be an oil or gas field, but also fisheries that they can control within those areas, so very significant for the countries concerned. Okay, not all maritime disputes uh, are resolved um, peacefully through the ICJ and ITLOS. There's some really heated ongoing disputes in the South China Sea and between Japan and um, China. I'm just look, going to look at a couple of them. The Senkaku or... Uh, can some, I had, we had, I think, the, uh, in our early lecture I mentioned this and there was a nice person from China who could pronounce the, how is it said in Chinese, in Mandarin? The Dai Yutai? Can I say it louder? Come on, someone who speaks Mandarin, what do the, what are the Senkaku, so they, they're called the Senkaku um, Islands in Japanese. Okay. I can't, I can't pronounce them very well. Okay, uh, so there's the Senkaku in, uh, in Japan and then the People's Republic of China, um, which is mainland China, um, and then the Republic of China is Taiwan. So there's three countries that, well, obviously we get back into that dispute about whether Taiwan is a country. No one virtually, no one recognises it because of the sensitivities in mainland China. But Taiwan claims um, the Senkaku Islands themselves. So they're significant islands. You know, you're not looking at like a small reef or something. They are real islands. Uh, and there's a lot of history to them. Japan basically um, annexed them when Japan was, you know, a great military power uh, in the late 1800s, basically um, controlled them from that point on. Um, but they were obviously close to mainland China. China claims a historic right to them. Um, Japan has basically had them for the last few hundred years and they were recognised in the peace treaty with the United States of America as belonging to Japan, but obviously that wasn't, uh, that's not a treaty that China was, um, you know, a, doesn't recognise that as being um, determinative of, of the territory. And there's been uh, a lot of activity um, in Japan about basically changing the, becoming far more um, militarised again. There's been, uh, if you've seen in the news, there's been heated, heated um, disputes between the two countries. Um, I won't play, because I'm going to play a few more clips um, through the lecture, I won't play this one, but there's serious talk about possible war or you know, a real flare-up between the two countries because they both have such a long history of antagonism between them. You know, Japan uh, has invaded China at different times and you know, there's been a lot of um, grief between the two countries. So these, this <coughs> dispute is seen as a real flare, flare point for them. 
Neither country wants to back down on the claim of sovereignty to the islands. Uh, Japan, uh, China keeps sending vessels into the area. The, um, uh, Japan has a uh, coast guard and um, uh, air force that are quite strongly defending the islands, but without it actually coming to um, armed conflict at this stage. Hopefully it won't, but it is a real potential that there could be armed conflict between Japan and China over these islands. And the interest here isn't the islands themselves, it's the maritime zones around them, the control of fisheries as well as potentially petroleum. I want to talk about another very contentious maritime dispute which is China's U-shaped claim for territorial waters in the South China Sea and the Paracel and the Spratly Islands. I just flag that this is separate to the um, Senkaku Island dispute in the East China Sea. So the Senkaku Islands are up here. But this is um, China's uh, nine dotted line which forms the basis of Beijing's claim of sovereign rights uh, over basically a series of reefs extending well south of China, a long way beyond, it's about 600 nautical miles um, south of China uh, and it comes within like the Philippines here um, and Brunei and Malaysia, it cuts down to about, um, about 10 nautical miles for them. So, uh, and Vietnam as well cuts well within its 200 nautical mile EEZ. So all of these countries are very concerned about um, China's claim. Uh, and here's just a bit of background. There's rich resources in this area, but it's also a very, very important shipping area. Uh, and there's been a lot of dispute between the countries. Um, here's the uh, claimed EZs. So Vietnam claims this, you can see the yellow line here. Um, the Chinese U-shaped claim comes massively within the EZs. So Brunei claims an EZ. Um, the Philippines claim is here within that area. I'm sure the Philippines, I don't know why that doesn't show the Philippines would claim something up around here as well. Um, the Malaysian claim is this purple one and the Indonesian claim as well. You can see just isn't, um, aren't maritime zones just their little melting pot of conflict? Um, you know, and you can see why we've built up through how you resolve over, you know, um, claims where there's wrapping coastlines. And here we have multiple countries uh, you know, wrapped around this little area uh, you know, splitting up their maritime zones is actually really hard. And then China's U-shaped claim just comes through pretty well all everyone else's claims. Um, and uh, actually this is just a different map. So the dotted lines here show EZs for the Philippines. Um, that would be China's normal EZ under 200 nautical miles. And then there would be an area of high seas in the middle where no one had um, an EEZ over uh, and there you've got Philippines, Brunei um, and <coughs> Vietnam particularly. Uh, and so the, the U-shaped claim, even look right down here with um, Brunei, it virtually comes to the coastline. <laughs> so, uh, and it's really heated. Um, here's some of um, uh, a Chinese fleet basically being, ex I think, escorted. This is shows Chinese boats being chased after alleged illegal fishing in the South Korean waters uh, in the Yellow Sea. Um, I just want to play you a bit before we break. Um, I just want to play you the first minute of a this. A territorial dispute between China and Vietnam is at a flashpoint, with senior officials from each country trading barbs over an oil platform in the South China Sea. The two sides met in Hanoi yesterday in an attempt to ease tensions after China built an oil rig near the Paracel Islands, which each country claims as its own. The Vietnamese say China has violated its sovereignty, while Beijing says that Hanoi has been running unlawful interference near the oil platform by sending ships to the area. 
The ABC's Southeast Asia correspondent Samantha Hawley was on one of those ships, a Vietnamese Coast Guard vessel, and filed this report. This is an ocean battleground where dangerous territorial disputes unfold. Two communist regimes at loggerheads. With national pride, sovereignty and territory that they both claim as their own at the state. I'll put the link to, to that up. There's heaps of stuff uh, on these disputes if you um, are interested in it. I'll put this link up on the Blackboard site. Just wanted to play that just to give you a bit of a taste with some of the action. There's lots of footage of fishing boats colliding with coastal vessels and the like. Particularly Vietnam has been um, at loggerheads with China over this, uh, the, the claims and the activities in that area. Uh, yeah, you've got a question, Matsumon? For China, yep. Yeah, so, was that the area that they claimed that they, they were interpreting as a curve in the coastline where they could draw a straight line? And so wouldn't that claim that they marked it have stated to the that area? Uh, no, I'll just repeat your question so that people listen to the recording and hear it. So, this dip here, um, is that somewhere where they would want to claim a. Sorry. Where they would want to claim a. Um, ability to draw a straight line. Uh, the straight lines are basically back here when you're setting up the territorial sea. Yeah, right. So uh, this, th I would think that th these bumps come from an island that's like there and another island probably that's here or somewhere. So there'd be, that would be, I would have thought, the reason for those bumps. That bit there is probably 200 nautical miles from Without knowing the, you know, the exactly the reason for that, that would be my understanding of what the reason is for that. But basically, this, you know, this massive—it's about 600 nautical miles. The U-shaped claim has really no basis in international law. It's really um, an assertion, um, a very bold assertion. Um, I, I, sorry, you got a question? Yes. So what happens to the American ship by? So if another country buys an island, uh, well, you can't really buy an island in that area. Uh, countries buying and selling territory is actually really rare. Alaska is a rare instance. You can gain territory, historically you could gain territory uh, in only a few ways. One was by conquest, but that's been outlawed now under the um, UN Charter because you can't you basically have to, um, you can't basically use military force to conquer other countries, that's, that's outlawed, but historically you could. Um, and then um, buying a country or buying territory was also a way that you could gain sovereignty. Uh, or you could, um, if land was terra nullius, if there was no one there, then you could also claim it uh, and establish effective occupation over it as well. And that was historically the famous, in Australian law, the British originally didn't recognise the traditional owners, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, and claimed that, there, that it was terra nullius because they didn't see them as having a civilisation. Uh, and that was overturned a few decades ago by our High Court, which recognised that the traditional owners, the traditional custodians of the land actually um, did exist, uh, and um, so that's it, it. Sort of upended as the Australian um, uh, concept of how it came to be, but it's just a quirk of gaining sovereignty. Yep. Um, what, what the UN said about the Crimean Peninsula thing? That they did a referendum, didn't they, to, to absorb into the Crimean Crimean Peninsula? So the U the, the um, Ukraine 
you know, that peninsula that comes down from Ukraine. Uh, and what's the UN said about it? I don't exactly know what the UN has said about it. It's not um, necessarily recognised. Like a country, like a little area just can't decide that it wants to leave a country. Uh, the referendum really should have been of the whole of the Ukraine. Uh, you can't just have little bits breaking away. The real reason why it's able to do it is because Russia is supporting it breaking away and Ukraine might not be able to stop it just from military might, but it's not, probably not lawful under international law what's occurred. Got a lot of questions, so just have these two, so Mart Simone. So, um, in Hawaii, so many people are actually involved in the program to make the army. Is Hawaii still producing islands? I don't think on a, on a time frame that really is going to be, you know, like new islands popping up. It may be, but um, I, <laughs> I don't think they, I don't think they, there's an active volcano is there. Well, <laughs> okay, I, I think we're getting off the track a bit. I don't think islands are going to be growing that quickly. So, um, question? When does the International Court of Justice step in? That's a great question. Um, the countries have to agree. So, do you think, why do you think, so Nicaragua and the like agreed to basically going to the ICJ? China and Japan, do you think they would send their dispute to the ICJ? No. Neither of them want it to go there. Um, because, why? There's too much to lose, yep. And they just don't want it to be arbitrated by an independent body. They would just prefer to basically, they're big and powerful enough to stamp their, you know. Um, you think about those countries that submitted to the ICJ, they're all fairly small countries that are trying to work things out peacefully. But when you're a big country, you tend to thumb your nose at international arbitration because you, like China, would just say, bugger off, you know, we're, the, you know, we're big, we've got a big military, we are now an emerging superpower, we're not going to be told these are our islands, and if you don't like it, you know we'll fight you for them. So. Yeah, actually, based on what you just said, like in terms of not the um, Sankaku Island dispute, but the, that Southeast Asia dispute, even yep. like China has an enormous military, and they're also on the UN Security Council, so like they can basically enforce that zone and delay any sort of intervention. Uh, the UN decides, so like, actually does. Yeah, there is the added thing that China is a, on the UN Security Council, so it could block any. Um, resolutions uh, against, um, basically against its activities in the South China Sea. Having said that, if basically there was armed conflict with, say, Vietnam defending what it says is its EEZ, then Vietnam is entitled to use self-defence to, you know, stop. So it, you know, it doesn't actually need a um, Security Council resolution to defend its own territory. So there is a real possibility of um, conflict in these areas. I just wanted to mention, and I'm not, I know that we've got a number of um, uh, students from China. I'm not particularly criticising China because I'm going to make the point that similar strategy has been used by other nations for centuries, including the USA and Israel now. But I, I really thought this was an interesting report. It was released by the US uh, in April, uh, the USA. Uh, and this was an article about it, China's new weapon for expansion uh, called Lawfare. And it was a report um, by Professor Stephen Halper for the US um, Secretary of Defense in 2013. And the US took a really unusual uh, step of releasing it. And it, this um, Professor Halper talked about three warfares in the Chinese strategy to gain um, territory. Uh, basically psychological warfare which seeks to influence or disrupt an opponent's decision making capability to create doubts, foment anti-leadership sentiments, to deceive comp opponents and attempt to diminish the will to fight against among opponents. Uh, and it employs diplomatic pressure, rumour, false narratives and harassment. Um, media warfare, um, also known as public opinion warfare, is a constant ongoing activity aimed at long-term influence of perceptions and attitudes. Uh, and also legal warfare exploits the legal system to achieve political or commercial objectives. So these three warfares is a really interesting concept. Um, you can find the report online. I'm not, can I just flag, uh, so the report is written by the US about China, but clearly, you know, the US has used this, these 
different forms for many years. You know, how did Japan get open up? You remember Japan was a uh, closed, you know, it closed itself off to the Western world. And then, how, does anyone know how Japan got opened up? Admiral Perry essentially just sailed in a bunch of warships. Yeah, the USA sailed in a bunch of warships and basically demanded that it open up itself to trade. So basically, the US threatened them. Um, and their, um, their navy was so overwhelming that the Japanese emperor basically um, agreed because there was no choice. And you see a very similar strategy also, not particularly to cri criticise Israel, but clearly Israel uses a lot of um, media warfare. There's a, you know, the, the recent excursion to Gaza, there was a huge public relations blitz by um, Israel to basically sow stories around the world about you know, how what it was doing was right. If anyone, you might have seen there was a Sydney Morning Herald columnist who wrote an article criti critical of Israel and got absolutely attacked in social media until he said, you know, he called them, you know, I think effing wankers or something. And the <laughs> paper told him to basically that that was unacceptable, um, you know, to, you know, use that sort of language to respond to public comments in the thread. And he told them, told the paper to you know, that he resigned basically over it. And so basically he gave in to the trolls, um, was my thought. I actually really, I thought he was a really good columnist, so I was sad to see him go. But uh, clearly there is a lot of um, media warfare now that goes on from multiple countries, so not particularly criticising uh, China. But I think it's a really significant thing to be aware of, you know, what we see in the media about these territorial disputes. Countries invest a lot of time and resources into it. It's potentially worth huge amounts of money to them. Um, so there's a lot of things uh, going on that aren't, you know, aren't obvious. Uh, and the fly in the ointment for the USA in this is that it's never ratified UNCLOS. So in this dispute, when it tries to, you know, stick up for the Philippines or um, uh, Vietnam, China says to it, well, you're not a party to UNCLOS, so how, you know, basically get lost. Um, and um, that led to, the, as I mentioned in the last lecture, the uh, US military basically going before the Senate in 2013 when uh, Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State and basically pleading with the Senate to um, authorise the US ratifying UNCLOS because they felt from the military perspective, it was really compromising the USA's position. And the Senate, you know, it's got the words UN in front of it, so, or letters UN in front of it, so clearly, you know, it's the... I was going to... Anyway. <laughs> I won't go there. Okay, let's take a um, uh, bit of a break, hey? Um, stand up. Um, we've talked about maritime zones. We'll come back and we'll talk about deep sea mining. Welcome back to the second half of our lecture. Are those lights a bit dark? I might just turn them up a bit. Okay, welcome back to the second half of our lecture. You recall that before the break, we were looking at the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS, and we'd run through maritime zones. We had a really good discussion with lots of questions about disputes about maritime zones. It's a fascinating area. It's fascinating because, often because it makes a huge difference to different countries, and particularly in an area like the South China Sea, there is an enormous number of countries with a lot at stake, and potentially, you know, hopefully it won't lead to armed conflict but there is a real potential there. I wanted to mention, um, before moving on to fisheries, deep sea mining uh, control outside of EEZ. So within EEZs, countries can control uh, mining activity and also to the edge of their continental shelves. But under part 11 of UNCLOS, beyond the continental shelf, who can control it? Uh, and this is one of the big sticking points, apparently, for the USA signing up to uh, UNCLOS is that the Senate uh, don't like the idea that they would be subject to this international body called the International Seabed Authority, which is established under UNCLOS to regulate access to the deep seabed for mining. Uh, 
so there's the International Seabed Authority. You can, it's got a website. You can go and have a look at it if you're interested in deep sea mining. Um, just in terms of definitions, um, UNCLOS confusingly refers to the deep seabed as the area. I wish they just called it the deep seabed. But anyway, the area means the seabed and ocean floor and subsoil thereof beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. So beyond the EZ, but also beyond the continental shelf, you've got the area. Uh, and then the authority means the International Seabed Authority and activities in the area mean all activities for exploration and exploitation of resources in the area. And then part 11 talks about the area. And if you just replace in your mind the area with the word the deep seabed beyond national jurisdiction. Um, principles governing the area, it's the common heritage of mankind. So um, obviously the exclus exclusory sexist language of you know, the time, uh, you know, it's not the common heritage of humanity. Um, but we're excluding women from this, so it's only um, the common heritage of man. Um, so sexist language of the time aside, um, Article 137, legal status of the area and its resources, no state shall claim or exercise sovereignty or sovereign rights over any part of the area or its resources. Uh, and basically all the resources in the area are vested in mankind as a whole uh, and it basically goes on to give authority to, sorry, it gives the authority, the seabed authority, the ability to control um, access to those areas. Now, the deep seabed hasn't been mined um, until very recently just because it was so difficult to get to. Um, but now there's a lot of interest in um, um, deposits, particularly around hydrothermal vents. So this is just a map, the, the little yellow dots show you a range of areas where there's a whole heap of, um, of these vents. They're basically along um, the margins of, um, of tectonic plates. And so here there's you know, like these areas that are obviously in the middle of the ocean, um, and some not in the middle of the ocean, but basically uh, in these areas there's things um, this is just colloquially called a smoker, a hydrothermal vent, uh, and around those um, vents there can be deposited um, metals, heavy metals, um, gold and the like, uh, in much higher concentrations than you naturally get, so potentially able to mine those areas for the heavy metals. So there's an example of seabed mining at the moment. It's within the um, Papua New Guinea's EEZ, uh, and it's basically in this area. You can see the um, exploration licenses that have been granted by Papua New Guinea um, in red uh, and then some other applications in yellow shown here. So, um, and basically this is just a few images I've grabbed of the area that um, this company is looking to um, extract uh, and they're developing the technology to be able to go into really deep water and basically send a hoover along and take up all of the uh, material around those vents and concentrate it. And so we're seeing uh, a lot of technological advancements in this area and it's going to be uh, an increasing area of, um, of development pressure in the future as technology advances. So I just wanted to flag that. Okay, I want to move on to fisheries management under UNCLOS. And, uh, I want to distinguish here between fisheries within the EEZ. UNCLOS is very strong on management within those areas and basically countries can control fishing activity within their 200 nautical mile EEZ. Distinguish that from on the high seas, so basically beyond the EEZ. And beyond that UNCLOS is really weak. It's basically UNCLOS covers a lot of things really well but the high seas was obviously just something that they couldn't get agreement on moving beyond the, the historic constraints on your countries are only able to regulate their own flag vessels. So they pretty well left it to a vacuum and didn't really move in beyond what customary international law provided, which is pretty well nothing. So on the high seas, uh, there's a whole range of other fisheries, international fisheries conventions that are really important. 
uh, and I'll talk about a couple of examples of those in relation to southern bluefin tuna and um, the central and western Pacific, just as illustrations. Now, you all know about the decline of fish stocks um, from you know, your own general knowledge, but I'm sure on other subjects you're doing as well. Uh, I just <coughs> thought this illustration was quite graphic. Uh, it caught my eye a few years ago. It's examples of fishery, of trophy fish caught uh, on um, Key West in Florida. Um, from charter boats. In 1957, um, this was the trophy fish that won the competition. Uh, and there's a number of, someone pointed out to me that there's some of these big fish now gropers, um, which are now protected so don't show up, but there's other fish here that are massive. And then this is it in the early 1980s. You see the fish getting a lot smaller. And then this is the winners in 2007. So you go from massive in the 50s, winning the competition, to pretty well things that I think should be thrown back. <laughs> and that won the competition in 2007. Um, and as I say, someone's pointed out to me in a previous lecture that gropers are now fully protected, so then you could actually, there could be big examples of gropers, but um, all these other teeny things, just to think a really good illustration of decline in fish stocks in a particular area. Another famous example of a collapse of a fishery is the Atlantic cod, uh, which was found uh, in, um, around Europe, but also over to Greenland and then um, the Canada and northeastern of the United States. Uh, and this is a graph showing uh, the fisheries landings in tons of the Atlantic cod. And you can see it begins here in the 1850s. Uh, and then it spiked in the 1960s and 70s as technology enabled much greater fishing um, effort. So it's pretty stable, see, up to that point. And then that huge spike with a lot of, obviously, technological advances in that period. Uh, you can think about the things that were developed out of the wars like sonar, a lot better navigation systems, so ships being able to target um, particular areas and also much stronger uh, a lot of things like nylon um, that was developed during um, World War II. Um, so you, you suddenly had much stronger lines, much stronger fishing nets, much stronger vessels, much more powerful. And um, just reading here from a um, report from a few years ago, from the late 1950s, offshore bottom trawlers began exploiting the deeper part of the Atlantic cod stock, leading to large catch increase and a strong decline in the underlying biomass internationally agreed quotas in the early 1970s, following the declaration by Canada of an EEZ in 1977, uh, national quota system ultimately failed to arrest and reverse the decline, and then it crashed to basically being wiped out in the early 1990s. So that's a very famous example of a fisheries collapse. Okay, so if we look at uh, the UNCLOS regime, and I'll just... Uh, recap on a few of the EEZ measures. So um, Article 61 says, a coastal state shall determine the allowable catch of the living resources in its EEZ. And Article 61 continued says, the coastal state shall take account of the best scientific evidence, and ensure that there's proper conservation and management um, of basically living resources within the EEZ, that they're not endangered or overexploited, uh, and as appropriate, the coastal state and competent international organisations um, shall cooperate to this end. And they'll be designed to maintain and restore populations of harvested, harvested species. So quite strong, or very strong. Uh, Article 62, the coastal state shall promote the objective of optimum utilisation of the li living resources in its EEZ. Uh, Article 62 goes on that nationals of other states um, should May, well, basically must comply with the um, measures of the coastal state within the EZ, including licensing, what species can be caught, seasons, age and size, etc. as a whole. So it's very detailed. And I'm going to contrast this to what you get for the high seas in a moment. Article 73 allows a coastal state to enforce its laws uh, and regulations within its EZ, so it can go and board other vessels even if they're not flagged within its um, within it um, and it can arrest them. Um, I just want to show you an example of actually catching people or catching a ship and the difficulties of it. 
This is um, available on my website as a case study. Um, it's uh, about the arrest of the Volga in 2002. I just want to emphasise the point I've made in previous lectures about the need, well, to be effective, international law like UNCLOS uh, has to be enforced at a national level. So you've actually got to get boots on the ground or ships in the water, for more appropriate for fisheries laws, uh, and actually go out and stop illegal fishing. So uh, in this case, Australia sent uh, the HMAS Canberra um, down. It was a case that occurred over a decade ago. The Canberra now has been retired. I think it's a dive site off Perth, so it's been sunk and made into a dive site. Uh, but basically the ship, the Volga, was uh, fishing around Heard and McDonald Islands, which are sub-Antarctic islands that uh, Australia has recognised sovereignty over. Uh, they're about 4,000 kilometres southwest of Perth, so they're a bloody long way. And uh, the vessel was uh, intercepted just outside the EEZ. It was actually fleeing the EEZ at the time because uh, its sister ship, the Lena, I think, was, um, had been just been arrested by the Canberra and it obviously radioed to its companion ship to basically get out of here, you know, the Navy's here. So it was fleeing for the high seas. And under UNCLOS, to arrest a vessel, uh, you have to begin what's called hot pursuit within your EEZ. Hot pursuit is an actual term um, in, in UNCLOS. It's not from the Dukes of Hazard or, you know, some crazy um, movie. Um, you have to begin hot pursuit within the EEZ. Uh, and hot pursuit has to be begun by some sort of contact beyond just radio contact. So you have to have a visual contact or be able to, um, um, by sound, you know, loud hailer um, call to them. Uh, and the Canberra sent a helicopter, uh, but it um, reached the Volga just outside the EZ. So here's the EZ. The Kerguelen Islands is... Um, does anyone know who the Kerguelen Islands belong to? France. I thought you'd get the one, David. Um, so uh, they're French um, islands. So, and you can see the EZ is split between the two. Um, so it, they're very remote, snow-capped islands. This is um, Heard Island. Um, there's some old. Um, this is an old weather station. Uh, this is uh, Australian personnel being winched or abseiling down to the Volga when it had been arrested. This is a picture back up of the helicopter, and. I want to just show you some um, footage, if it will play. <coughs> so um, I'd like to thank the Australian Navy for giving me this um, footage. So this was taken by the naval officers when they boarded the ship, so it's raw, um, but interesting. So this is January 2002. It's an interesting image. <laughs> ah, no? So this footage is taken when the helicopter had just reached the Volga and it was just outside, you know, the sound isn't that great on it, but it was just outside the EEZ, so they radioed back to Canberra and said, you know, what do we do? It's just left the EEZ, we haven't commenced hopper shoot. And anyway, they were told to board it anyway. So I'll just jump ahead a bit. So they're filming it from the helicopter. This is hopper shoot has commenced. And they're waiting for the camera to catch up. 
basically the camera's caught up to them and here's the um, helicopter now they're boarding. And so you can see um, these guys are fast rappelling down these big ropes. And so I'd be thinking, hey, am I just going down over the sea here? It looks like they're like he's just going into the ocean. I'd be saying, hey, what are you guys doing up there? Can't you see? I need to be over there. I think he's pointing. Okay, he's down. So they all repel out. They don't actually, they just grab on with big gloves, they grab on these big ropes. Yes, they were. But they only boarded them when the HMS camera was actually in visual distance, so you're not really going to resist at that point when you've got a warship basically. <laughs> um, Russia. You can't get that from Volga? Sorry, I just want to get to the bit where they're actually in the helicopter. Uh, so here we are back on the warship. going out of the helicopter. So see that big rope? They just grab onto that. So imagine that you're like 40 metres above this ship and you just grab that rope with your gloves. Grab it and go. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I look forward to that. Okay, so that's thanks to the Australian Navy. It goes on for a bit. But let's go back to some slides. Um, so um, they went on board and there were some customs, uh, not customs, some fisheries officers with them. So the guys in grey are the Navy officers and the guys in blue are Australian um, fisheries officers. And they went on board and um, the ship claimed that it was just going through the EZ and it hadn't been fishing. But they went down, they found they're after um, Patagonian toothfish. So there's some Patagonian toothfish. Here's the crew assembled on the foredeck. You can see the Canberra in the background. Um, but they went um, down onto the sorting decks. Um, there were, uh, I think, long lines that had just been pulled up that were wet. Uh, and they also, the um, fish that were attached to the lines um, were still pliable. And when they lifted up, it talks about this in some of the court judgments, they lifted up the gills and they bled. So what does that say about the fish? just been caught uh, and just come up. So the claim that you know, it's just innocent passage was just bullshit. And the, um, the Russian captain produced a log which showed that they hadn't been fishing in the Australian EZ, um, but the um, crew was able to um, basically hack the computer system and they downloaded the GPS tracker that was on, or basically they worked out from the um, ship's own computer basically where they had been in the last um, few weeks and it was all within the Australian EZ. So that was all used in evidence uh, against them. So the ship was um, basically um, not towed. They sailed it back to uh, Canberra, not to Canberra, to Perth. Um, it'd be difficult to sail it to Canberra. Um, and Russia then challenged the arrest of the ship uh, and the refusal to release it uh, in the federal court. Uh, and there was also, or well, the company challenged the arrest in the federal court and lost, the Australian federal court, and there was also a challenge by Russia in ITLOS against the refusal to release the vessel. Uh, and ITLOS was um, quite uh, castigated Australia a bit, but because um, Australia had commenced hot pursuit outside the um, 200 nautical mile EZ, so it was actually an illegal arrest. Um, anyway, so it went to ITLOS, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, um, which also heard, you might recall, Russia arrested some Greenpeace um, people, actually on the high seas, so, um, but the 
the Greenpeace brought an action, in, or the, I think the Netherlands brought an action in ITLOS for the release of them. So it's an important tribunal. Um, this is it sitting, so lots of judges again, I think about 20. Um, you can find the judgment on, um, as I say, I've got a case study of it on if you're interested in it, uh, in that stuff. Just want to summarise by saying UNCLOS provides strong powers um, to coastal states to control fisheries within their EZ. The arrest of the Volga is just a graphic example of the difficulties of doing it. You know, you often in very remote locations, expensive to do. Um, the fishing vessels now are high powered, they have their own um, radars, they can see ships coming, they you know, try and escape out into the international waters before hot pursuit is commenced. So it's a real, um, it's very difficult for coastal states often to enforce their laws. Yes? How do um, they actually lay out judgment? Is it in fines that take away their ships? Like how, how do they um, actually lay out judgment most of the time? Like how does it usually fall? Sorry, how do they lay out they judgment? Have, so like say they found Russia guilty for fishing illegally in Australia. Well. It wasn't so much Russia being guilty, it was a company that was flagged in so Russia was just bringing an action in Idlos on behalf of its um, a company. Russia didn't actually pursue it too strongly because it was clear that they were illegally fishing um, and Australia had bent the rules or bro basically broken the rules but um, uh, the thing that they were complaining about was that um, Australian law forfeited the vessels automatically to Australia. Uh, and so we, Australia routinely takes Indonesian vessels that sail into our northern EZ and it will take them and they're forfeited to Australia and then they just take them and destroy them and then they fly the crews home. Um, so basically destroy the vessels. It's quite common to do that. There's hundreds of Indonesian vessels that are arrested every year. So, But this was a bit bigger than like the smaller fishing boats that come from Indonesia. Okay, so UNCLOS is really strong within EEZs. Outside of EEZs on the, on the high seas, it's really um, quite weak because states lack jurisdiction uh, when you've got a, a vessel that's flagged with another country. And uh, I've talked about flags of convenience before. So on the high seas, fisheries management is particularly difficult. If you look at part seven, the high seas and UNCLOS, it's really weak. You don't get anywhere near the detail that you get for the EEZ section. So basically it says, okay, the high seas, we're all going to cooperate to do, um, uh, to do right, but basically uh, there's freedom of navigation um, and basically freedom on the high seas. Uh, there is some um, conservation and management provisions for the high seas, right to fish in the high seas, um, there's a general right to engage in fishing subject to their other treaty obligations uh, and to respect national measures for conservation of living resources in the high seas. But that's pretty well it. It's very weak. And so there are a lot of uh, treaties that deal with particular fisheries that go outside of national EEZs and for cooperation. A good example is um, the conservation of uh, Southern Bluefin Tuna Convention, which was signed in 1994. And I'll just run through that briefly. So Southern Bluefin Tuna, uh, amazingly beautiful fish, um, big schools, uh, distributed pretty well all around the world in the Southern Ocean. Uh, a particularly important um, area though is just south of Java in Indonesia, it, there's spawning grounds, so northwest of um, Australia so that's where they spawn. So they all aggregate, they come together there, they swim all around the world, but they come together there to spawn. Um, and they're massive fish, they grow up to 200 kilograms. Uh, and here's some fish that uh, have been frozen and obviously ready for um, sushi. So they're incredibly lucrative. Um, uh, this is a picture from last year. A sushi restaurant paid a record um, 155.4 million yen, which is 1.7 million dollars for a 222 kilogram bluefin tuna. So 1.7 million dollars for a fish. I mean it's a beautiful big fish, but that's a hell of a lot of money. Um, so because they've been so incredibly popular, um, particularly in Japan, for 
um, sushi. They have been heavily targeted and since the massive explosion in technology in the 50s and 60s, their stock has plummeted till they're less than 10% of their original biomass. <coughs> Most of the fishing um, through the, this is just a, a graph showing um, fishing effort. You can see it really spikes um, in the 1960s and that's due to the technology being there to catch them, to go out, um, good, you know, good sonar, big powerful fishing vessels coming online, huge effort from Japan, um, a significant effort from Australia, but Australians don't generally eat um, tuna. It's really Australia's effort is to sell it to Japan. Uh, and then there's some other countries coming in in the last few decades. Um, this is just a, some graphs showing the different catches in different periods. So uh, in the 70s and 80s, um, that top graph shows a lot of uh, the catch occurring off the south of Africa and also sou south of Australia. And then the next one down is the um, 80s and 90s. And um, the catch there distributed um, and similarly during the 90s and to 2005. And this is the most recent period. So it just changes in where the catch is occurring. But you can see it covers a massive area. Um, I might not. How about I just play you just a little bit? for the conservation of the southern bluefin tuna holds its annual meeting next week and Lakeline understands that a confidential scientific report will reveal the stock of the highly prized fish is heading towards a total collapse. But Australia's tuna fishermen claim fish stocks are recovering and that there's no need for a moratorium on the fishing and export of southern bluefin tuna. As Late Line's Suzanne Smith reports, Australia's relationship with Japan is very much at the centre of the row. The southern bluefin tuna traverses four oceans. Southern bluefin tuna is a rather amazing animal. There's one known spawning area in the northeast Indian Ocean. The adults mature at about um, 10 to 12 years old, so they're quite late maturing. They migrate to that area um, and spawn several times during the spawning season. But the level of the spawning stock is causing great concern. It's been ravaged by a combination of overfishing and illegal fishing. As far as we understand at the moment, the biggest threat to southern bluefin tuna is fishing. A few years ago, the Japanese government admitted to illegally taking thousands of tonnes of tuna over its allowable quota over a 20-year period. It's believed the figure could be as high as 200,000 tonnes. Greenpeace is campaigning... OK, I won't go on with that. You get the idea. I just wanted to mention this... Um, the convention that was agreed in the early 90s to try and conserve them. So after decades of exploitation, the, the stock collapsing, this convention was agreed um, to conserve the tuna. You can see the objectives there. They established a commission in Article 6, um, the Commission for the Conservation of Southern Bluefin Tuna. And at the commission, each party has a single vote. So Australia, Japan, uh, all the other countries that are parties to it, uh, they uh, aim to conserve, manage and optimally utilise southern bluefin tuna and the Commission gets to decide on total allowable catch. Uh, they use a lot of science to try and um, back up their decisions. Uh, so you can look at the Commission's website, it's got a huge amount of information there. This is just showing the um, recruitment basically dropping, the biomass dropping to somewhere in the order of 10% of its original biomass in the, you know, currently. So this is a from a graph from a report in 2009 showing uh, at that point in 2009 if they had different catches going from no catch being this one here, they thought that the stock would recover quite quickly through to if they had a catch of 15,810 tonnes that basically the species would be wiped out by 2022 or so. So, and in between, there's a range of different catch levels. So, 
they drastically limited the catch based on this scientific report. So in 2010, 2011, you can see the catch being about 9,600 9, um, odd tonnes of tuna. Uh, anyway, recently they think that the stock has been recovering slightly and they have allowed a larger catch. The reported catch in 2010 was at 9,547 um, but basically they think that there is a recovering um, or the, the population is recovering and this is from a report last year. For the next three years the total allowable catch has been set to increase based on um, the scientific committee's advice to the commission. And so the commission has set the, what it's been advised by the scientific committee, it has set those as the total allowable catch and then it's split up between um, the members of the uh, convention but also um, non-cooperating members. So the Philippines, South Africa and the European community also have small catches but you can see the largest catches are for Japan and Australia. So that's an example of science being used to inform and countries cooperating with uh, each other to try and um, manage a um, species and a fishery. There's a similar issues for a lot of other tuna species. So there's the Pacific tuna is reported to be on the edge of um, collapse as well. I sent you a link uh, a few days ago to this really interesting foreign correspondent report that was on Tuesday and um, you can watch that Palau take a long line. Um, there was this fantastic um, president of Palau who's just he was wonderful I thought in the foreign correspondent uh, and basically talked about we need to take responsible action now to protect our children. Gosh, if we had more world leaders like him we'd be in a very different world. Um, the program discussed how Australia aids Palau to, uh, it's given it a, basically a patrol boat, it gives it um, assistance. Um, there's a wonderful um, footage in the foreign correspondent hearing from some of the um, members of the um, uh, police officers, the Palau police officers about their views on it. Uh, this was a screen grab I thought was really interesting. They were showing Palau and vessels that they were tracking. There was a requirement for all vessels to have monitoring devices and so there's these different vessels going out to the edge of their EEZ um, and they were looking at basically they're um, in that area they're under the Convention for the Conservation and Management of Highly Migratory Fish Stocks in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean. So um, that extends across an enormous area and it has about 27 members including Palau and Australia uh, and it has a close relationship with UNCLOS. So basically um, the objective of that convention is basically to assist or to further UNCLOS's objectives. So there's a lot of difficulties with enforcing those sorts of um, conven conventions. I won't discuss them now but both inside and outside um, it's very difficult. So can I ask you to watch um, that foreign correspondent if you haven't already. Um, it's available on iview. So to wrap up, um, we've covered UNCLOS, looked at maritime jurisdictions, deep sea mining and fisheries and we've looked at a couple of examples briefly of agreed um, high seas fisheries management. In summary, and this is the second last slide, international law of the sea has evolved significantly over the past century and it's important to understand this background. UNCLOS is a very important framework establishing national jurisdiction over adjacent maritime zones um, but there are important ongoing disputes in some areas linked to control of resources such as the Senkaku Islands. Third, coastal states can control fisheries and resource extractions in their EEZ uh, and this is a particularly important zone. Fourth, enforcement of fisheries laws remains difficult particularly in remote areas and finally management of fisheries outside of national waters and high seas remains very difficult and there are many international conventions dealing with specific fisheries. And so final slide, further reading, I'd really like you to watch if you haven't already uh, that foreign correspondent report. Uh, it goes for 28 minutes but it really, I just thought it was so good. Uh, so please watch it. Um, you can have also a look at the websites for UNCLOS the, and those other conventions. There's heaps of information there. So. That's the lecture.
Thank you very much. And for those who are uh, still wanted to give a presentation of your research proposals, uh, we'll stay here and we'll go as long as you want. So thanks very much, guys.